Who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it is in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness? Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham, and the Scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. Now that's our key verse right there. But let's keep reading. So then, those who are of faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Now when we talk about the gospel, like we're doing this week at this meeting, we're really not just sharing our own private opinions with one another. We're not just giving our own personal interpretations of what we think the Bible is saying. That's not the gospel. This is not just someone's opinion. This is not just someone's personal perspective. The gospel is a revelation from God. We cannot afford to be wrong about the gospel. We cannot afford to be ignorant of the gospel because it's the gospel of our salvation. As we've already heard earlier, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So if we, if we neglect it, or if we're willfully ignorant of its message, or if we distort it, or if we turn to a different gospel, there's salvation here that's at stake. There is no other message that can save. Amen. Accepting a false gospel wrecks churches and will cost people their souls. Amen. Now that the gospel has been revealed now that the light of the gospel is shining we have no excuse for turning away from it for rejecting it for distorting its message or turning to lesser things and we know that there are teachers today even in the church who have infiltrated into the ranks of the church who are teaching another gospel, one that does not conform to the gospel revealed, for example, by the Apostle Paul here in Galatians. For example, there are people today who are still attempting to be justified by a principle of law, a principle of works. There are still people who think, if I'm good enough, then that's good enough for God. If I just do the right things, then God will, God will accept me. God will justify me. There are people, especially these guys on TV, who are teaching that what God really wants to do is he wants to prosper you. He wants to make you healthy and wealthy and wise in a, in a worldly sense, in an earthly sense. Not justify you or give you eternal life primarily. That's nice, you know, for after you die. But the real thing is to, is to enjoy yourself here in this world. That's a, that's a popular gospel. It's called the health and wealth gospel. Paul wrote to these Galatians because they had heard, they had heard the gospel from Paul, but then they'd heard another gospel. And they had accepted it. 
and they were turning away from the gospel of the grace of Jesus Christ and were trying to be justified now at, by a principle of law. What's behind this situation in Galatians is there, there was a group of men, there were a group of men from within the church, men who claimed to be Christians, who claimed to be leaders, who claimed to be teachers. Paul calls them the circumcision. And they had come into this place. Galatia was not a single city. It was actually a region. Like Jasper County is a region. They had come in and they had gone from church to church. And they had taught another gospel. They were teaching basically that Gentile Christians, non-Jewish people who had already heard the gospel from Paul, who had believed the gospel and become Christians, that that, that wasn't enough. There was more that they had to do before they were really accepted by God. They had to be circumcised and obey the law of Moses. And if you do that, then you're, a, then you're really in. Faith in Christ is not enough, according to, these, according to the circumcision. And, and Paul, if you read Galatians, you will notice that Paul minces no words in addressing these men. He is absolutely merciless with these false teachers. He, he says that they are false brethren. He doesn't say they mean well. He doesn't say they're just a little misguided. He said they are false brethren. Brethren, he actually said in chapter 1, if, any, if even an angel from heaven teaches a gospel, then other than the one I taught, let him be anathema, which means let him go to hell. Paul was not polite when it came to someone turning people away from the gospel. See, we're, a lot, we're much too polite today. We don't take this as seriously as we should. Now, the leaders, if you read the book of Acts as a background to Galatians, the, this issue had already crept up. In Acts chapter 15, the, the leaders of the church had met in Jerusalem. They had a council about this very issue. What are we going to do with these Gentile converts? Do these Gentile converts have to become Jews first in order to then become Christians? And there was a group, a group of people in the church that said yes. And they met and they decided no. Remember they said It's by the grace of our Lord Jesus. That's what Peter said. It's by the grace of the Lord Jesus that we're saved. The same as the Jews. And so Paul, when he writes to these churches in the region of Galatia, what he has to do is go back again to expound the gospel, particularly the doctrine of justification by faith. The Galatians have been turned from the gospel of justification by faith to the principle of law that cannot justify. That's, that's the background behind what Paul is writing here in the third chapter of Galatians. And Paul writes with a, a tone, a sense of alarm and urgency. If you compare Romans to Galatians, you'll notice the tone is different. Romans doesn't have the same tone as Galatians. Because the situation is different. A lot of the doctrines that are taught in Galatians are taught in Romans. But the tone in Galatians is very different. It's, it's, Paul is, Paul is he, he's afraid for them. This is not a trivial matter. At, this, is, this is at the very core of the Christian faith. It's at the very core of salvation. And so we learn here in Galatians how serious it really is to turn away from the gospel. This is a big deal. So, here's what, we're going to, here's what we're going to see as we unwrap this text and this topic. When Paul expounds the doctrine of justification by faith, and that was the central issue here, when he expounds this doctrine, he bases his argument on Abraham. And that's the, it's the same in Romans 4. Very similar wording. On this foundation of the example of Abraham and his faith, Paul builds an impregnable theological superstructure. And any legitimate message 
This is the relevance for us. Any legitimate message that is preached today must also be built on this solid foundation or it's not a legitimate message. It's another gospel. It's got, it's got to conform to this message that Paul is expounding for us here. The core, Paul says the core of the gospel was preached way back there in Genesis 12 to Abraham, who at the time, I believe, was just Abram. And all of redemptive history in Scripture is the gradual unveiling and fulfilling of that original message Preach to Abraham. So to unpack this subject in this text, I'm going to do it in three, three ways. Number one, we're going to look at the revelation of the gospel that was preached to Abraham. Secondly, the exposition of that gospel. And thirdly, the application of the gospel preached to Abraham. So first of all, consider the, the revelation of this gospel to Abraham. What really happened... If you go back to Genesis 12, what really happened there when God spoke to Abraham and spoke this original promise that Paul quotes here, what God was actually doing is revealing his purpose to Abram. God was, if you, if you can see it this way, God was letting Abram in on a little secret. He said, Abram, I, I, I'm going to tell you a secret. I got a secret I, I want to share with you. This is what I'm going to do in, for the entire history of the world. This is, Abram, this is what the entire history of the world is going to be about. I'm going to bless the world through you, through your seed. That's all in Genesis chapter 12. And this statement in Genesis 12 should be viewed as a kind of preview of the rest of redemptive history. A similar statement is found even earlier in the human race, by the way, in Genesis 3.15. Remember after they had sinned, God said to the woman, said about the serpent, he said, you'll, you'll crush his head, he'll bruise your heel. That's, that's, that's another little, a little insight into this mystery of God's purpose that from one perspective, God said, my purpose is I'm going to defeat the devil. From another perspective, it's the same purpose, but another aspect of it is, I'm going to bless the world. And so you see that God is kind of leaking his, his purpose. He's telling us, very, this is at the beginning of human history. He's telling us what he's all about, what he's going to do, what the history of the world is really all about. From the very dawn of human history, from the very dawn of the human race, we have some explicit statements from God about what he is going to do. God is committing himself to a certain purpose and plan for human history. And everything that follows in the rest of Scripture and the rest of history is going to be a progressive unveiling of those stated objectives. Particularly the statement that is made to Abraham. God never forgets his promises. God never deviates from his purpose. God doesn't, God's not wishy-washy. He doesn't change. God doesn't need a plan B. God is not like a quarterback in football who looks at the defense and says, oh, I didn't expect that. Let me call an audible. God doesn't need to do that. God says, this is what I'm going to do. And that's what he's going to do. Can anybody, like, stop him? <laughs> I challenge you to try. Satan has done his best, and he hasn't succeeded, and he's a lot smarter than any man. There is no alternative to this plan because God is not simply reacting to what humanity does or doesn't do. God is not waiting. Let, let's see what they'll do now. I wonder what man's going to do. He's not, he, that's not it at all. There seems to be this idea out there, and it's, it's not usually said this way, but there's this idea out there that God is kind of like a heavenly janitor. And that what he's doing is he's just kind of waiting around with a mop bucket and a mop to clean up the messes that humanity makes with our free will. 
But that is not the picture of God the Bible paints for us at all. The Bible shows us a God who has an eternal purpose. Something that was already in the divine will from the very foundations of the earth. In another place it says Jesus was a lamb slain from the foundations of the world. Nothing catches God unprepared or causes him to have to switch or shift his plan. Now, let me make this, let me make this very practical. What, what, how is that practical? It's practical because that means you can trust God. Amen. It's as simple as that. You can trust God. He's not going to change his mind. He's not going to change his plan and forget to tell you and leave you in the dark. If you, if you take God at his word and you trust him, that is the safest place in the world to be. Amen. Because everything that God said that's going to happen is going to happen. The only question is, is are you on his team, so to speak? The incredible thing here is that God wants us to know his plans. That's why he's doing this with Abraham. God is, it's like God has set out on a mission of self-disclosure. That God says, what, you know what I really want to do? I'm going to create this world, and I'm going to create this race, and I'm going to reveal my glory to them. I'm going to create a race of people, and then I'm going to reveal more of my glory to this this race of people. The whole point of the biblical record is to reveal God's plan and show how God himself has carefully prepared the stage for the drama of redemption to be played out. God has not hidden himself or his plans from humanity. God is not playing a game of hide-and-go-seek. Now you see me, now you don't. There's a consistent plan, a consistent revelation of God's purpose. Now, there happens to be times in history when precious few people seem to know that plan. At this point, there's one man and his wife who are going to know what God is up to in the world, so to speak. But the point to be seen is, is that God is still working. God is always working. Even when we can't see it exactly or clearly, God has not deserted his creation in spite of their sin and our rebellion against him. He's working, see. He's working out his plan. Salvation is such an enormous undertaking, such an enormous enterprise that that God took what to us seems like long periods of time to develop this purpose. And so you'll notice in the biblical narrative, if you read Genesis carefully, you'll notice that while the spotlight is on Abram, it seems like the purpose of God is just kind of crawling along, barely going anywhere. Years and years go by. Abram, poor Abram and Sarai, they just get older and older and older. She's still barren, still barren. The purpose of God seems to be just, just crawling along. God let all the other nations go their own way. What is God doing? What is he doing? What is he, what is he up to? He's only speaking out of all of the nations in the world. He's talking to one man. And yet after years and years of careful preparation, the result would be, the end result would be that the whole world would know and see the glory of God. That reveals something to us of the the sovereignty and wisdom of God. You see, someone might ask, why did God have to do it this way? Well, I suppose God can do anything he wants. That's an easy answer, but... I think a deeper reason is that the effects of sin on the human race have been so profound and far-reaching. And the world has been at such variance with God, so alienated from God, that God could not have just revealed everything he was doing to the whole world in, in in some flash and blaze of glory all at once. There's some mercy here. 
God is doing this in a way that, that we can see it and we can, we can um, benefit from it. This is grace. God is using Abraham to teach us something so that when, so that when the seed that was planted in Genesis 12 begins to bloom and bear fruit, we'll recognize that it was God. This is God's handiwork. And so, throughout the Bible, as we read the rest of Scripture, God wants to be known as the God of Abraham. Why do you think that is? He wants to be known as the God of Abraham. It's because he wants us to remember, to think about what he said to Abraham in Genesis 12. Now, if you go back to Genesis and you read the narrative, this revelation of God's purpose in Genesis 12 comes right after the record in Genesis 11. Do you remember what's in Genesis 11? That's the story of the Tower of of Babel. And so as you're reading along there in Genesis, the focus shifts. In chapter 11 to chapter 12, the focus suddenly shifts from the scattering of all the nations at Babel. It shifts and the the, the focus just goes way down to one man, Abram. Now, if you know anything about Genesis, the book of Genesis often follows how God chooses to work with certain men and their descendants, while he rejects other men and their descendants. For example, Cain is rejected. His descend- there are no more descendants of Cain. They died in the flood. After the flood, the the focus, or excuse me, after Babel, the focus shifts and narrows to Shem's line. Remember, Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and and Japheth. The focus then zeroes in on Shem and his line coming to Abram. Now, what are we learning there in all of that? And most people, you know, they come to Genesis and you read all those begats, you know, so-and-so begot, begot this guy, and you can't even read the, most people can't even read the names. Why are those in the Bible? We just skip over those. But what we're seeing here is God's sovereign choice, what the Bible calls the doctrine of, can I say it, election. In other words, God gets to choose who he wants to work with and who he doesn't want to work with. Is that okay with with everybody? It's not up to men. In fact, you read the Genesis account, nobody's going to God and saying, God, you know, can you please do something about this situation? Nobody's doing that. Before the flood, it said that every thought and intention of man's heart was only wicked from birth. The initiative and the purpose is God's from start to finish. And this point is illustrated again very graphically for us in Genesis 11 with the account of the Tower of Babel. And I want to I look at that for just a moment. An excellent summary of what happened in Genesis 11, right before we read about Abraham in Genesis 12. An excellent summary of Babel is captured in the aphorism that, quote, man proposes, but God disposes. That's what Babel is about, in a nutshell. Babel was not the purpose of God. Genesis 12, Abraham, I'll bless you, that's the purpose of God. Genesis 12, Tower of Babel, not the purpose of God. Babel was the rebellious product and project of a united, sinful humanity. It's not always good when people get together. It's good for us to be together. It's not always good for people to get together, even when they're united, not if they're against God. 
And so they get together in the plains of Shinar. They have this plan. They start building this tower. Uh, it's going to reach to heaven. It's gonna, we're going to make a name for ourselves. And God, and God says no. And he intervenes. The city of man will never be successful. But the city of God is going to be built. Starting with Abraham. So you might ask yourself, what city are you a part of? Are you a part of the city of man? Babel? The spirit of Babel is still with us, you know. It's called in the New Testament, the world. Or are you a member of the city of God? Paul said later, the Jerusalem above, that's our mother. He said that in Galatians. Two cities. City of God, city of man. Abraham himself lived in a city. It was the pagan city called Ur. Ur of the Chaldees. It's believed that this city of Ur was located in the same area where the Tower of Babel had been built and then abandoned. Scholars say that in Ur, there was a center for pagan worship there. There was a temple there in Ur. Perhaps a smaller version of the great tower that was never finished. And the scriptures indicate to us that Abram and his family, while they lived in Ur before God called him in Genesis 12, they were pagans just like everyone else in Ur. Perhaps giving worship to the heavenly bodies and other aspects of nature. Throughout history, all pagan societies have been polytheistic, worshipped many gods, and they worshipped aspects of the natural world that they either feared or depended upon for life. And so the first thing God does is he gets Abraham out of there. you got to get Abraham out of Ur. He's got to leave. There had to be a separation. There had to be a calling out of this man out of the old life and into a newness of life, a life that did not depend on the creation and the cycles of heavenly bodies and the seasons, but a life of faith and dependence on the creator of those things. That's what Abram's being called to. Leave your country and your father's household and go to a land I will show you. Abraham's call, or at this point it's still Abram, Abram's call represents a radical new kind of vision for life in the world. You see, in some sense, Abram and his call to leave Ur is the beginning of God's plan to in some way reverse the curse of Babel. Abram represents a kind of person who is the very opposite of what happened at Babel. For example, Babel ignored God. They had their own agenda. They were seeking their own glory. On the other hand, Abraham's faith and Abraham's obedience will give glory to God, and so will yours. In the same way, the gospel calls us out of the world. Get out of there. Get out of Ur. Get away from Babel, the continuing spirit of Babel. Repent of your idolatry, depending on false gods. Believe, turn to the living God. You know, Christians are called, it says in the New Testament, Christians are people who have turned from idols to serve the living God. Amen. So God makes this promise to Abram in Genesis 12. That promise was a promise of blessing for the world, not just for Abram, not just for his descendants, but it was a promise of blessing for the world. Remember, this is right after Babel, where all the nations are scattered what world is God going to bless? That world. It would come, God says, through, to Abram, through your seed. 
or descendant. And in, we fast forward now back to Galatians. Paul gives us a little lesson in biblical hermeneutics here. You want to learn how to interpret the Bible? Paul gives us a little lesson in how to understand the Bible. He says, now that word seed, he says, in the original language, it's singular, not plural. It doesn't say seeds. He doesn't say, God doesn't say, I'm going to bless the world, Abram, through your seeds. He doesn't say, I'm going to bless the world through your descendants. He said, I'm going to bless the world through your seed, singular, a single person, a single descendant. Now, Abram was promised a multitude of descendants. But the multitude of descendants, that's not going to be the vehicle for the blessing. Paul says it's singular, it's seed. One person, one particular single descendant of Abraham is going to be the vehicle through which God blesses everyone else. Who is that person? Well, of course, it's Jesus. See, that's how you interpret the Bible. It always goes back to Jesus. <laughs> that's a little lesson in biblical hermeneutics. In other words, Christ is the fulfillment of the promise God gave to Abram, just as Christ is ultimately the fulfillment of all of God's promises. They're all yes and amen in Christ. It's all about him. The Bible's about Jesus. It's about God blessing the world through Jesus. So Paul is interpreting Scripture with Christ and the gospel at the center of it all. And any reading and interpretation of the Bible today that puts something other than Christ in the gospel at the center of Scripture is inherently flawed. And that's why so many people today misunderstand and misuse the Scriptures. See, the Bible's not about you. It's not about me. The Bible's not about the church. The Bible's not about the American dream. The Bible's about Jesus and God's plan through Christ. Jesus is the divine means of blessing. Amen. You get blessed through him. If you're not in him, you don't get anything from God. It's just that simple. You cannot be blessed without Jesus Christ. You remember, Abram was waiting for a son. In order for Abraham to be blessed, he had to have a son and an heir. And so later... After God, re after God revealed that promise to Abram, he decided, along with his wife Sarah, to take matters into their own hands. And with Hagar's help, Ishmael was born. You remember the story. But Ishmael, the Bible says, was not the child of promise. He was born the natural, human way. And there would be no blessing through Ishmael. Instead, a son was going to be born to Abram through Sarah, a barren old woman. Because that is something that only God can bring to pass. Isaac, the child of promise, now stay with me, I'm developing a thought here. Isaac, the child of promise, was not born because of the strength and will of man. He was in some sense born of God. But Isaac, you see, is a type. He's a type. He's a picture of another child who would eventually be born into the world, conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of a virgin. And so the blessing, see, God is establishing this precedent. The blessing can only come through the child of promise. So Ishmael's rejected and sent away. Sounds cruel to modern ears, but God's, you know, they're sent away. But God's establishing something here. Ishmael's rejected. He's sent away. He's not the child of promise. And so it is with all human efforts to secure the blessing of God. Hagar and Ishmael represent all those who are in bondage to legalistic religion, which is a striving, which is a human striving in the flesh after the divine blessing. God says it's never going to work. Amen. Ishmael has to go. The blessing, the true blessing, the real blessing, the blessing that God promised, 
is an act of sheer grace. In other words, it's something that God gives. It's not something that you get on your own, by your own reaching and striving and working. By the way, believers are called children of promise. Those who are born of the Spirit, born of God, those are the ones who obtain the blessing. The natural children, those, those in the flesh, they're rejected. Sent away like Ishmael. Let me, let me summarize and we'll move to the next thing here. The preaching of the gospel to Abram in Genesis 12 was really the revelation of the divine purpose to bless the world through Jesus Christ. Now secondly, we move to the exposition of the gospel preached to Abraham. We see in the rest of scripture there's an unpacking of this. This just kind of gets bigger and bigger and bigger as we go along. Especially when we come to the preaching and teaching of the Apostle Paul. The exposition of the gospel. We see that this blessing included the blessing of justification by faith. Let's talk about that. Besides the promise of God in Genesis 12, the most important thing said in Scripture about Abraham is in Genesis 15, verse 6. Genesis 15, verse 6 says that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. One of the most important verses in the entire Bible. So much is based on this. This is one of the key statements in all of Scripture. This shows us, this is teaching us that we must come to God by faith. That's the only acceptable way. The only way to be right with God or justified is to believe God, to believe his word, to trust his promises. Through Abraham, God is showing us that he will justify those who believe him. God is establishing this principle of justification by faith. Now, this, this in itself is an act of grace. Because God could have just as well decided that he wasn't going to accept anyone on this basis. But he, but he says, I will. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you I will. Here's an example. Abraham. I will accept people who believe me. I will do it. Amen. There, there's the precedent right there. Abraham. Without trust, there can be no fellowship with God. Think about this in your own life. Isn't it true that all sin, at the root of all of our sin is basically the failure or the refusal to trust God. If you trace it back for, far enough, we sin because we don't really believe God. We don't believe, for example, that He has our best interests in mind. We don't believe that, we, we believe that perhaps He's keeping something good from us. God's just really a cosmic killjoy. He just doesn't want me to enjoy myself. We may think that he's not really telling us the whole truth. There's got to be more to this than that. Isn't that what was behind the serpent's temptation in Genesis 3? Can't really trust God. Did he really say that? Well, you know, God will say anything just for effect. He's just trying to scare you. He's just trying to intimidate you. Can't really trust him. But Abraham shows us that if we want the blessing, we must trust God. Amen. Now what is true for Abraham is true for believers in Christ. God will also credit righteousness to those who believe the gospel of Christ. We have received a promise from God like Abraham did. In the gospel, if we believe it, then God will declare us righteous, credit righteousness to our account. It should be made clear here that this faith that justifies is faith in the gospel of Christ, not simply believing that there is a God that might exist somewhere in the universe. I want to make a distinction here, and it is, an important, it is a very important distinction, especially in our times in this culture. Many people today say they believe in God, 
And that can mean almost anything. Of course, the, per- the person coming to God must believe that he is. You have to at least start there. I understand that. But the faith of Abraham is not simply to believe in God that he exists, but believing what God has said and revealed. So do you, do you see this distinction I'm trying to make? There's a difference between believing in God and believing God. Believing what he has said, what he has revealed. That's the faith that justifies. That's Abram's faith. Abraham is the biblical standard for faith in God. He's the father of the faithful. God has chosen to teach us about faith by incarnating that principle in the life of a person. God likes to work this way, by the way. He likes to work through people. And so to teach us about faith, he incarnates that principle, see, in in this man, Abraham. Abraham shows us what it means to believe God and to live by faith. Abraham believed even when it seemed illogical, at least according to human reasoning, to believe. Hoping against hope. People in their 90s don't usually conceive children, even in Bible times. God gives us hard things to believe, things that are not possible apart from his power to call them into existence. So Abram's faith is the kind of faith that saves, including believing Gentiles. We get in on this. He's the father of all true believers, Jew and Gentile, who become his children by having his kind of faith. See, if your faith isn't like Abraham's faith, it isn't faith. Now, this promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis 12, this promise is what we call, it's a unilateral promise. And here's what I mean by that. It's one-sided. The the promise that God made to Abram is all God. It's unilateral. It's unilateral. God is going to do everything, and there's nothing for Abram to do except believe. Now, I want to develop this. This might, and some might object to this, but I'm going to show you this is actually what, this is the case. This is the truth. This promise that God gave to Abram was not the result of an agreement between God and Abraham. Uh, Abraham did not negotiate terms with God like he did a little bit later about Sodom. You remember how God, he... God was going to destroy Sodom, and Abram kind of did a little negotiating there. Well, what if you find ten men there that are, what if you find five, you know, kind of negotiate with, there's no negotiating in Genesis 12. Abram simply had to accept God's offer. In other words, God didn't say, Abram, if you do this, then I'll do this. That's not what he said. God just said, I'm going to do this. Now, someone will object at this point and say, ah, wait a minute, Did, but didn't Abraham have to do something? I mean, he had, do, do, didn't Abraham have to obey? Don't we have to obey? Well, of course, and Abram did obey. Abram obeyed God because he believed God. And so will you. His faith was tested and confirmed, and possibly at its highest point, when he willingly was going to sacrifice his son Isaac. You see, faith is always followed by obedience, or it isn't faith, at least not Abraham's kind of faith, and believers who trust God will give up anything the Lord asks them to lay down. You'll do it. So this is the nature of the new covenant, a unilateral promise. The new covenant is not an agreement between God and man. It's not a deal that you make with God. You know, some people make a deal with God. God, if you'll do this for me, I'll go to church at least three Sundays a month. But the new covenant isn't like that. It's not a deal. It's not an agreement. There's no bartering. There's no, there's no arbitration. The new covenant is like God's promise to Abram. God did not give Abram a law and say, Abram, if you obey this law, then I'll bless you. He didn't say that. Jesus did not come to bring us a law 
Jesus came to secure the blessing promised to Abraham. And we were not involved at all in the securing of that blessing. Christ did it all, and we get the benefits. We get blessed. And someone will say, well, isn't there something for us to do? Yes, believe. Your response is that of faith. We trust God to do for us what we ourselves could never do. And when we do that, the believer enters into what the New Testament in the book of Hebrews called the Sabbath rest for the people of God. There is a Sabbath rest for the people of God. The new covenant, what I'm saying and what Paul is saying is that the new covenant is the fulfillment of the promise made to Abram. Abram himself did not receive the blessing, but he saw its fulfillment by faith. Actually, Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. God brought about that fulfillment in his own time. And so, brothers and sisters, we are living in a wonderful time in human history. Don't miss this. this. There's a great responsibility here. Because God, this has been done. The promise has been fulfilled. The blessing is available. Are, are, are you taking advantage of this? Do you know the gospel? Are you believing the gospel? Don't miss out on this blessing. Don't miss out on what God is doing. You see, the old covenant was not like the promise. The old covenant was not like the promise to Abram. The old covenant was based on the condition of the obedience of the people. God promised blessing or cursing to Israel. Remember those two mountains, Gerizim and Ebal? Blessings over here, cursings over here. If you obey me, I'll bless you. You don't obey me, I'll curse you. But the promise to Abraham contains no curse unless you curse Abraham. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to go there, as they said. The old covenant was a covenant of works and had to be kept perfectly. And the blessings were entirely carnal, not spiritual. Even if you did keep the law, the best you can get is like a lot of cattle. And that may mean more to some of you than others. But that's about the best you could do. Those who preach the health and wealth gospel, you see, are under the wrong covenant. That covenant's obsolete. We got something better now. Come up to speed, please. So the promise to Abraham was God's original purpose to which the law was added because of sin. I'm developing what Paul does in Galatians here. We don't have time to read this whole context, but it's there. Remember, the purpose of God does not change. God didn't shift to something else. He didn't change his mind. He didn't make a mistake. He wasn't surprised. God never wavered from this promise to Abraham. And see, he still won't. The promise, Paul says, came first, which means the promise is distinct from the law, which came much later. These are two different things. Don't get them confused. The law was not the original purpose of God. It, what Paul says it was added to the original purpose until the time of fulfillment came. And then the law would pass away, having served its purpose. The law had to be added to the promise because of the universal problem of sin, which was not directly addressed in the promise to Abram. God did not reveal to Abram how he would handle the universal problem of sin. The promise to Abram was blessing for the world. But the, but the law was given for the formation and instruction of a single people. To this chosen nation, the descendants of Abraham, God gave his law to them to teach them what it means to be in covenant with a holy God. So the law was never given to justify anyone. It was given to educate us about sin. You see, everyone who comes to God, at least to the true God, must come into contact with God's revelation to Abraham's descendants. Now, Israel was not chosen because they were better than other nations. 
they weren't just more moral or something like that. The Israel was chosen because they came from Abraham. And the promise was made to him and his descendants. Now, by the time Jesus comes on the scene, it seems that the Jews had forgotten the rock from which they were hewn. They tended to think that they were righteous in God's sight and accepted by God simply because they had the law in their possession and in their minds. They forgot about Abraham and his faith. If the law could have made them righteous, then the example of Abraham and his faith is absolutely meaningless. So someone might ask, why was the law given? Well, it could not have been given as a source of righteousness because Abram was justified by faith before the law was given. In fact, Paul makes a big point in Romans that he was even justified before he was circumcised. So it can't be that. It can't be that way. There has to be another reason for the law. God had to show that righteousness cannot be established by works. Remember the law had to be kept perfectly for righteousness to be established that way. But no one keeps it. So everyone's guilty. And in need of another source of righteousness. Which God in his grace would provide. So just to develop this a little further, the principle of faith and justification by faith that we see in Abraham and the principle of law are two different and irreconcilable principles. By principle here, I mean the way something works. In fact, the word principle and law can actually be used interchangeably as we use in the, like the laws of science or the laws of nature. This is the, it's a law, it's a principle, it's the way something works. Justification by faith works in one way and the law works in another way. These two principles are so different that we must choose one way or the other on the path to justification. We cannot apply both ways, such as starting with faith and finishing with law, which is exactly what the Galatians were doing. Paul says each principle, he's saying you can't do that. You can't start out this way and end this way. The, each principle excludes and nullifies the other. You've got to pick one. Are you going to be justified by faith or are you going to be justified by the law? These principles are representative of two different mindsets and approaches to God. Now religion is basically our approach to God. How do we approach God? The principle of law, for example, approaches God in the following ways. These are characteristics of people who approach God through the principle of law. Law places confidence in what the person does, in your performance, what you do, how obedient you are. The approach of law will bring a certain fear and distance or alienation from God in the person's mind and heart. This is because with law, there will always be the reminder of failure and falling short. So you will always approach God that way. You've fallen short. So law will never bring the worshiper confidence or rest. There's always more to be done under law. On the other hand, it is possible for those under law to become self-righteous and proud thinking that their work is sufficient to commend them to God. This person may regard himself as superior to others who have not done as much as they have, like the Pharisee in Jesus' parable, who thanked God he was not like other men. People under law are constantly keeping a record, measuring themselves, making lists of things to do or accomplishments that they have completed. And they expect to be rewarded or compensated for all of their hard work, just as an employee expects to be earn a wage from their employer. That's a law mentality. People under law tend to regard God as harsh, as a harsh and critical taskmaster who is waiting to punish every minute mistake and oversight. And so those under law are always in bondage to fear. Fear. 
Faith, on the other hand, has the exact opposite effect on the worshiper. The principle of faith places confidence in what God has done, his work. The believer trusts in God and what he has done, not in himself. And so there's peace and there's rest. The believer is not keeping score, is not thinking of himself at all, in fact, but only about the Lord and his promises. Believers do not view God as a harsh taskmaster, but as Father. And they boast only in him, not in themselves. To sum up this whole thing, those who approach by law, Paul says, rather than by faith like Abraham, cannot be justified or blessed or call themselves children of Abraham. Law does not bring the blessing of Abraham. It, only, it can only bring a curse. So let me summarize and we'll move on to the final point. The promise to Abraham included the blessing of justification by faith. This was God's original purpose to which the law was added because of sin. Law and faith are two different principles and approaches to God leading to two different destinations. Thirdly and finally, the application of the gospel preached to Abraham. There's two applications to see. First, the blessing of Abraham also includes the gift of the Holy Spirit. The blessing of God promised to Abraham was something greater than all of the physical blessings promised to Israel under the law. You understand that any physical blessing, and God can give physical blessings. He made Abraham rich. But any physical blessing, even those that come from the Lord, will pass away. God is interested in blessing us with something that is eternal, that will last. And it is an insult for us, an insult to God, for us to be wrapped up in material blessings when there is something so much greater available. Woe to those who preach a message from God that emphasizes material wealth or your life in this world. The blessing God wants to give is the blessing of eternal life. This is not a physical life. It's not biological life here in a fallen world. This world's going to pass away. This is eternal life. God wants to bless us with a life that will go on even when this world is gone. Even when your body is gone. God wants to bless us, in fact, with his own divine life. This is a life that raises us up from spiritual death. You were dead in your trespasses and sins but you've been made alive in Jesus. This is the gift and the blessing of God himself in the person of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, in believers. You see, God's purpose is to make us into children, his children. God does not need more servants. He has the angelic hosts. I'm not saying we don't serve God. But God is making us into sons. Which means we share God's spiritual DNA, so to speak. Children, in the biblical sense, share the characteristics of the Father. Sharing and even participating in the divine nature. Abraham's children are blessed by becoming children of God. Through the Holy Spirit. He, that's the adoption of sons. This is why even Gentiles can be Abraham's children. It does not depend on physical descent, but on a spiritual rebirth. The blessing of Abraham goes even further than justification. It also involves becoming a new creation. This means that believers are more than just justified sinners. Being a Christian is more than just you're still a sinner and you just keep sinning, but, this, but you get off the hook. It's more than that. Salvation is much more than that. This blessing of Abraham through the Holy Spirit changes our nature, turning us away from our iniquities, 
and turning us to righteousness. The blessing of God enables the believer by the power of the indwelling spirit to put to death the old life of sin and live a new life of sanctification, completely devoted to God. One theologian said it this way, and I quote, the gospel is the work of God for us in Christ. The fruit of the gospel, or sanctification, is the work of God in us by his spirit. Any view of salvation that stops with justification and does not continue on into sanctification, is not the blessing promised to Abraham, and is not the true gospel of Jesus Christ. I fear that there is a truncated gospel being preached in the land today that offers people no power for overcoming sin. The true gospel promises not only forgiveness, but a new life, a new nature, which begins now and culminates in glory. Here's the final thing. Included in this promise to Abraham is the new creation itself or the world to come, which eventually is going to belong to Abraham and his children. Now we have to go a little bit outside of the context of Genesis 12 to get this. But you remember that another aspect of this promise of God to Abram and to his offspring was the land of Canaan. The land becomes a significant part of the story of the people of God. And God told them it was to be an eternal inheritance. But we know that this promise involved more than just the actual land of Canaan that is called today Palestine. Even Abraham sensed that there was more to this promise than just the land of Canaan. We know that because in Hebrews 11 it says Abraham was looking for an eternal city with foundations. And we also know that this promise was made to more people than just the physical descendants of Abram. You have to begin to read the prophets to get this perspective. God's promise was to restore the people to the land after a period of exile. I'm talking about in the prophets. But you notice that when the prophets speak of the people being restored to the land, the vision includes a cosmic regeneration. I'm not going to read it for sake of time, but you can read Isaiah 65, 17 to 25. We know that the present heavens and earth in their state of corruption will pass away. But God is not done with creation. It will also be redeemed and liberated from its bondage to death. And this liberation of creation is directly linked to the full redemption and glorification of the sons of God who are also known as the children of Abraham. God's ultimate purpose, which began with his promise to Abram, is to create a people for himself with whom he can dwell forever. He is preparing all of Abraham's children for that time to come. But you see, like Abraham, we have not yet received the land. Remember, Abraham had the promise, but he never owned a foot of ground except what he bought to bury his dead wife. Like him, we are also living by faith as strangers and pilgrims here, not yet partaking, taking possession of the land. Believing in the promise of God will make us aliens in the world. The ultimate blessing of God is a whole new world, a new creation. The blessing that God is preparing for his people according to Revelation 21 and 22, is a world without evil, without Satan, without sin, without pain, without sorrow, without sickness, even without death. In other words, God is preparing us for glory, all of Abraham's children, which is the completion of his plan of redemption. This involves a new body to match your new spirit and to live in a new world. That's glory. The whole point of redemption and the promise to Abraham is to get us ready to inhabit the new creation. That's the ultimate blessing of Abraham declared in the gospel, which is the message that gets us ready for that glorious time. Now I want to summarize and conclude. We begin to realize as we read scripture that this promise made to Abraham, which was actually the gospel in embryo, is much larger than it first appeared to be. 
This is something that you learn something here about God. As time went along, God began to unfold his purpose with progressive revelations, but never moving away from that original promise to Abraham. It is doubtful that you can be a Christian without knowing something about what God said to Abraham, which has been fulfilled and will also be consummated in Jesus Christ. The promise included the blessing of justification by faith, apart from the works of the law, which could never justify. This blessing includes the new life of the indwelling spirit, and it includes the hope of glory. All of these blessings were promised to Abraham and are realized in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The main thing in life is to get that blessing promised by God to Abraham and in the gospel of Christ. Nothing else really matters. It is worth any sacrifice, any amount of suffering we have to endure, because there is truly a greater weight of glory for all of Abraham's children. Thank you, brethren.